Happy Sunday. Welcome, welcome to Heartway. I love that we get to have such a beautiful experience of God before the preaching even starts when we're here. And I hope you don't underestimate the power of just sitting and being still because there's something that happens within you. And I know, what's up? My fr- I love when I see friends. <laughs> Mikey, my brother. Of course, the worldwide exotic bu- bullies is here. We got, we got so many wonderful people. But don't underestimate the power of, of just sitting and being still. Because we talk a lot about experiencing peace. We talk a lot about what it means to know your true nature. But talking is one thing. Having a direct experience is a whole other thing. And sometimes it's important just to shut everything else out, get quiet, and just sit with you and God. And get into that posture of listening. Get into that posture of emptying yourself and see what happens. We empty ourselves, of course, so that we can be refilled. And so I'm hoping these words that I speak today can can fill up your tank if you've been feeling a little empty. I'm going to start by reading a few passages of Scripture. The first is John chapter 10 and verse 10, Jesus' words. He says, I have come that they may have life and may have it in abundance. It's a good word. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 8. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. And so the title of my message today is You Get What You Give. You get what you give. And I know some of you already know the truth of that because you live this. But we got to hear it again and again. You get what you give. When we hear the word abundance, what is it that comes to your mind? For a lot of us, it's things like wealth, success, blessing, riches. Something that I've learned from my personal experience, and you can tell me if this rings true for you. But for me, the definition of true wealth is knowing God. The definition of true wealth is knowing God. If you have God in your life, If you know what it's like to walk with God, if you have a relationship with God, you have something more valuable than anything else this world has to offer. So Jesus spoke of the kingdom of heaven as a treasure in a field. And he said there was a man one day that finds this treasure in the field and he sees just how valuable it is. So much so that he decides to go sell all of his possessions and buy the entire field. Because this treasure, the kingdom of heaven, the presence of God in you is something that is worth more than anything. That's the point. That's why we're here. Because we know that as we live in this world and we chase the things that the world tells us to chase after, even when we attain those things, we feel like there's something that's missing. God is that big something that is missing. What's funny is God is never far away from us. God is as close to you as your very breath. And we think we have to go somewhere and do something to find God when in reality, God is here. God is always now. God is always in this moment. You, in fact, are an expression of God in human form. And so we come to gather together in order to remind ourselves of what truly matters so that we can prioritize what actually counts. Because guess what? You can have a whole lot of money. You can have a whole lot of stuff. But if you don't have love, if you don't have safe spaces where you can be yourself, if you don't have happiness in your heart, if you don't wake up every day with a sense of fulfillment, if you don't feel like you're driven by purpose, if you haven't given your life to something that is much greater than you, I don't care how much stuff you have, you're poor. But if you have love, you have joy, you have peace, if you appreciate what God has given to you, you can have very little money and there will be people with lots of money who want what you have. Isn't that crazy? They will want what you have. 
Because what you have is what actually counts. So we live in a universe that is abundant. And God promises, promises us an abundant life. But in order to experience this abundance, we first have to expand our notion of what it means to abound. Because it has a lot more to do with than just money. Money adds to your abundance, but you can be abundant without money. Money adds to your abundance, but you can be abundant without money. It's actually an energy thing. Which can sound odd because for a lot of us, we equate abundance with having, possessing, achieving, attaining. But the way you step into a state of abundance is actually through giving. So in spirituality, a lot of teachers speak of the spiritual law of giving and receiving. And Jesus taught this in Luke chapter 6. Look at what he says. Give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So the idea is giving and receiving are actually simultaneous acts. The more you give, the more it flows back to you. Anytime that you give, you are also receiving something in return from your own giving. This is why if you talk to people who give their time to serve, to volunteer, to do good things with great organizations, even if you ask the people here who dedicate their life to this community, to building this up and to reaching more people, anybody who does good in the world will tell you they get so much more out of their service than what it is they're actually giving. Anytime you serve, Anytime your intention is just to purely be of help to other people, that is its own form of wealth. That makes you feel rich in some sort of way. It makes you feel abundant. You get something from that that is so much more than whatever it is you may be giving in the moment. So as counterintuitive as it may sound, in order to have what you want, you first got to give what you have. So if you want peace, share peace. If you want love, offer love to others. If you want joy, spread joy into this world. If you want prosperity, help other people become prosperous. And as you give, simultaneously you will be receiving from that giving. It will always flow back to you. And as you begin to cultivate this feeling of abundance... Again, it's a state of being. I don't have to have a lot in order to feel abundant. Just walk outside into nature and look at what God has blessed you with. Just look up into the sky. Just look at the trees. Just look at this beautiful planet that we get to inhabit. As far as we know, all the other million gazillion planets out there have zero life. We don't know that, right? But let's just say in our galaxy... All the other planets in our galaxy, as far as we know, have no life. And yet here you are. You won the jackpot, baby. You woke up this morning, and it doesn't feel like that, but it can feel like that. And once you start to feel that sense of abundance, you actually create more of it. So a lot of us think we have to wait until we have stuff in order to feel abundant. But the reality is, it's the reverse. Once you start feeling that sense of abundance, genuinely, and it comes through gratitude, (laughs) once you start feeling that sense of abundance, you start seeing the abundance around you. You start creating more of that abundance in your life. This last Wednesday, a pastor friend of mine was celebrating 25 years of uh, local church ministry and they were having this wonderful special anniversary service and I received an invitation it was a great time and while we were there the worship team was singing this song and the lyrics stood out to me so much maybe we'll start singing it one day I kind of tossed it over to Milena (laughs) this week I was like hey just a little song suggestion you know (laughs) you know just a little suggestion maybe Okay, it's a song with these lyrics. It says, miracle after miracle, 
open door after open door. Here it comes, so get ready for another one because another one is on the way. And you just kept, imagine just continuing to sing that over and over. Miracle after miracle, open door after open door. Here it comes, get ready because another one is on the way. That's what it means to live in a state of abundance. You just expect that stuff to happen. It's, it's miracle after miracle. And that isn't just something that God does for a few select holy people that he loves. No, this is the case for all of us. It's always miracle after miracle. It's always open door after open door. We just don't recognize it. But if we can begin to live with that sort of expectation, what are the things that could begin happening in your life? But we don't even have the ability to to recognize and notice what's right in front of our eyes. But when you live with this expectation, you recognize, okay, if, if something gets taken from me, that means God's making room for something better. If this door is closing, that means the next door that's going to open up for me, oh, my goodness. I had that experience not too long ago. I was um, doing some work with an organization that... Um, is just wonderful, and I was giving a lot of myself to this work, and the door closed on me out of nowhere. And I'm like, what? This was the perfect thing. This was such a great opportunity for me. I was thinking so much about the future and all of the doors that would open because of this opportunity and this work that I was able to do in partnership with this organization. All of a sudden, you know, you got haters out there in this world. And some people are like, oh, that Danny, you know, he teaches some things that we don't know if they're in line with our beliefs. And uh, next thing you know, I got the ax. And, and as soon as that door shut, I'm telling you, first of all, it was difficult for me. It was difficult because there was a lot of expectation about what could come. I was planning my whole life out. I'm like, oh, my God, I, I'm going to be able to do this and that and all these wonderful things with my chaplaincy work is what I'm referring to. And uh, that door closed. And as difficult as that was for me, I was so happy to just notice that deep down inside, I really did have this faith that, oh my goodness, if this door that I thought was so incredible and so perfectly aligned and designed for me just closed, then what God has coming for me has got to be absolutely incredible, mind-blowing. Who knows what this is going to be? And already, I've already started to see that in just a couple months' time. I've already started to see glimpses of that. Because now, right, as I, as I hustle and bustle and do my thing in the world just like you, I'm like, hey, you know what? I'm able to start making some money now um, on my own without anybody else uh, hovering over me, telling me what I need to believe or not believe, do or not do, in order to continue getting that paycheck. So if me losing this opportunity means I'm standing my ground a little better and becoming a little more self-sufficient in that way, what a blessing, man. I can keep saying what I need to say. I can keep doing what I need to do. And so when those doors close... Can we have that expectation that God's going to bring something better? All right, whatever, it, when, when things seem like they're falling apart, they're falling into place. Can we trust that? Why, when we get rejected, can we trust that it's just redirection? Can we trust that the right opportunities are always coming to us exactly in the right timing? The scriptures say, don't grow weary in doing good. Because in due time, you will reap a harvest if you don't give up. Oh, man. So that's the word that some of us need to hear today. Just don't give up. Because some of us, we feel like we've been sowing seeds. We've been giving our life to certain people, certain organizations, certain relationships. And we got nothing to show for it. It feels like we just were wasting our time working for you or serving you or helping you or building your dream up or doing everything for you and not for me, and I got nothing to show for it. You, none of your giving, none of your sowing is ever in vain. It's never in vain. 
In due season, you will reap a harvest. If you're sowing seeds, you will reap a harvest. And so that's why abundance requires generosity. Because the more seeds you sow, guess what? The bigger that harvest is going to be. It's all going to come back to you in some way, shape, or form. Now, here's the deal. It may not come back in exactly the way that you thought or imagined it would. And we've got to be okay with that. You're sowing these seeds with a specific expectation of what the harvest is going to be. But guess what? That harvest may come in a completely, totally different form. Sometimes you're not even the one that really experiences the harvest. Somebody else does. Either way, the harvest is going to come. Can we live in a state of gratitude and patience, not giving up, even though we don't see the fruit of our labor? What's interesting is we live in a, in a culture that is obsessed with consumption, which is the opposite of what I'm talking about with generosity, right? What the world tells us is work as hard as you can to make as much money as possible so that you can consume as much as you want. That's what happiness is. But many of us know that path actually leads to misery because what happens is we just end up craving more and more, never being satisfied with what we have. And so we live our lives comparing, we live our lives competing, we live our lives wanting what everyone else has, never feeling like what we've done and what we've accomplished is enough. And so guess what? Abundance isn't about having more. Abundance is about being content with what you have. And contentment actually gets a bad rep, unfortunately, because we think contentment means settling. If I'm content, I'm just settling. No, contentment isn't settling. Contentment is appreciating. And like I said earlier, when you start to appreciate what you have, you generate more of it. So contentment produces abundance. Contentment creates more abundance. Because now you're not operating from a state of lack. You're operating from a state of fullness. I already have everything that I need to accomplish the purpose for which God has set me on this earth. Everything else is extra. If I needed it, I would have it. Since I don't have it, I don't need it. And when I do need something else, God will give it to me. That's abundance. Starts with contentment. Because a generous person is really just someone who's grateful for what they've been given. Anybody who is generous is generous because they have so much gratitude for what it is that they have been given. In fact, they feel that everything that they have is a gift. Everything that they have has been given. So who am I to just hoard this and possess this as if it was all mine? It was given to me. And it was meant to flow through me into the lives of others. So when you keep that channel open, now it's just flowing through you. More is being poured in. More is going out. The gratitude flows into generosity. Generosity flows into gratitude. And it all just begins to multiply itself. It's beautiful when you begin to see this in action. Now, one important thing to, to mention is this. God is not like some sort of a vending machine, right, where it's like, okay, if I do good things, if I sow these seeds, if I'm a generous person, then all of a sudden, just good thing, only good things are going to happen to me, never any bad things. And that's not how it works, right? We don't live in a, in a mechanistic universe that works like that. Just read the story of Job. Right, Job was a righteous man. He did everything by the book. He walked closely with God. And he went through some crazy suffering. Lost everything. Lost all his possessions. His family members died. He, at one point, just wanted to curse God and die. <laughs> that was the feeling, the sentiment. So just because you do good doesn't necessarily mean now only good things are going to happen to you. Sometimes bad things happen to good people. And that's just a part of it. Doesn't matter how on point you are. Doesn't matter how much you live by these principles and values that we teach every week. And sometimes good things happen to really bad people. That part too, you gotta be okay with that too. And you're just like, what? Like, what? What? God, what? <laughs> and, and the big lesson God's always given us is hey, Mind your business. Just mind your business. Right? 
Jesus said the, the, the sun shines and the rain falls on the just and the unjust. Just stay in your lane. Don't worry about what God's doing with other people. Because what looks like a blessing could actually be a curse. If you had it, it would be a blessing because that's what you want. But because they have it, it's actually a curse. And it's keeping them from the main thing. But you don't, you don't know what's going on. So that's why we're not going to be worried about other people. We're just focused on ourselves. That's all, that, that's all it is. So sometimes bad things happen to good people. Sometimes good things happen to bad people. But at the end of the day, when you do good and when you put good energy out into the world, you increase the likelihood and possibility of experiencing good in return. That is one thing I can say. Right? I can't say if you do X, Y, Z, then for sure great things are going to happen to you. No. But when you do good and you put good energy out into the world, you certainly increase the likelihood and possibility of experiencing good things in return. And that's really what we're actually doing as a church. We're spreading goodness into the world. And we're doing that to increase the possibility of that goodness rubbing off on other people. We're spreading love into the world to increase the possibility of human flourishing. To increase the possibility of people coming to terms with who they truly are. Discovering themselves as they discover God. And I genuinely, genuinely believe, which is why I've given my life to this, that the church has a very important role to play in increasing the likelihood of goodness in the world, increasing the possibility of human flourishing. What we're doing, there, there are not a lot of spaces where people intentionally gather uh, to focus their attention on the higher good. It, it just doesn't happen. It's not normal, right? So this gathering, this community, has a very important role to play in the kingdom coming on earth as it is in heaven, like Jesus said. In ancient Judaism, the temple was actually seen as the center of their entire community. It was the center of their society. So the temple wasn't just seen as a place of worship. This was actually the social and political and economic hub of the community. Everything else revolved around the temple. And even though nowadays our society doesn't necessarily revolve around church, many of us as individuals and as families have decided to make it the center of our lives. Because we know that when we make God the center of our lives, everything else, all the other aspects of life benefit as a result of it. All the other realms of existence uh, begin to flourish in new ways when you keep God in the center, which is why Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God. Everything else will be added unto you. Jesus used the metaphor of the church as a city on a hill. We're a city on a hill, and our light is shining so brightly in a very dark world. And that's what we're meant to be. We're meant to be a light in the darkness. So that when people are attracted to this light and they step into this light, they can be reminded of who they truly are. They can be reminded that they're loved. They can be reminded that they matter. They can be reminded that healing is possible. They can be reminded that they're not alone. They can be reminded that God walks with them every moment of the day. We need these reminders. I need these reminders. <laughs> That's kind of the fun part for me about uh, being able to preach and teach. I'm really just talking to me, and you guys are just getting in on the conversations and the thoughts that I'm having within myself with God. These are just reminders for me. I actually feel like all my teachings, in one sense, are kind of like a spiritual diary of sorts. I don't like write in a journal, but I write sermons, and I share them with other people, <laughs> and they're for me. To be reminded, we have to be reminded. That's why we're this city on a hill shining this light so people can know they were meant to live in the light. It's better in the light. There's love and there's hope and there's healing in the light. And so we exist to give this light, to give this love 
and to pro uh, proclaim this message over and over and over again so people can wake up. What else in the world could matter more than this? So the way I see it, the way to change society is by changing individuals. And every time we're able to touch another human soul, we are now adding to the light that we are collectively shining. And so that's why when we talk about being generous, this is a great place to start, everybody. This is a good field to sow in. If you read the scriptures, the people of Israel always made it a point to give the first fruits of their crops and their herds to support the temple. Right? They would always provide these offerings to support the priest. They gave a tenth of their harvest because the temple was seen as an indispensable part of God's plan for bringing liberation to humanity. And so what does that mean for us? Well, it means not only are we called to be generous as a church, which we are, we give ourselves so much in service to this community. Not only are we called to be generous as a church, but we're called to be generous towards the church. And in the words of Mother Teresa, I love it how she puts it, it's not about how much we give, but how much love we put into giving. And so at Heartway, we're looking for a specific kind of giver. The first kind of giver we're looking for are people who are doing the work with us. People who feel called to do this work with us. If you're somebody that is putting into practice what you're hearing, that means you see the value of what it is that we're doing. And that means you understand the benefit of gathering together, which means you're exactly the kind of person that we're looking for to support the cause. Because people who feel called to this work alongside of us know that by giving to this community, we're really just giving to ourselves. And Jesus put it very well when he said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So where's your heart? What do you treasure? What do you prioritize? What matters to you in life? Secondly, the kind of giver that we're looking for are people whose hearts are in the right place. Jesus shared this story about a poor widow, and there were a bunch of people in the temple courts. Jesus was by the area where they drop off offerings, and he saw a bunch of wealthy people going and giving their offerings. And then there was this poor widow who showed up and gave two coins, which was nothing in comparison to what everybody else was given. But as soon as Jesus saw this poor widow giving her two coins into the offering, he turns to his disciples and he says, you see this woman? She has given more than everybody else that's here today because she's been giving, she's giving sacrificially. She's giving everything she's got. She's not, she's not just giving the little extra stuff here that doesn't affect anything. She's putting it all in. Talk about faith. Talk about prioritizing the kingdom. It's about your heart. This is why Jesus said when, whenever you do give, when you're generous, not just towards the church, but just in life, right? Don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. <laughs> because ultimately what God cares about is your motives. If you do the right thing for the wrong reason, you've missed the whole point. There's a lot of people who do the right thing with the wrong motives and intentions. And a, and a lot of it, especially like when you get into certain circles with people that are more influential and have a lot of wealth, I mean, giving and being generous is really just about, look at me, applaud me, look at how amazing I am. And well, we'll take your money too, by the way, if you want that. I'll put your picture up here and we'll give you your five seconds of fame if you want, okay? But hey, listen, that's not the point, right? That's not, that ain't the point. That's not the point. If you're giving so everybody can, you know, pat you on the back and say, wow, you're so amazing. Oh my God, you're incredible. It's like, no, bro. That's between you and God. Is your heart in the right place? 
I love how Byron Katie puts it. She, she goes, true generosity happens without any awareness of being generous. A truly generous person isn't like, oh, yeah, look at how generous I am. No. Generous, uh, generosity just becomes like second nature. It's just, it's just what I do. Of course I'm going to pay for your lunch. It's just what I do. You know, you're not going to pay me back. You don't owe me anything. Right? You, you're not even aware of it. The holiest people... This also matches with that. The holiest people aren't even aware that they're holy. That's not even a thing in their mind. They're not thinking about it. Because the moment you start thinking about it, you create this identity around it. And now you're trying to be seen in a certain way. We want people whose hearts are in the right place. And then lastly, we want people to give who, who want to create a lasting legacy. You know, I have the opportunity of speaking with a lot of different ministers and visiting a lot of different churches. I mean, I was ordained when I was 21, and I'm 34, right? So 13 years already, and I feel like I'm still super young, but it's been 13 years that I've been doing this, so I've seen a lot. And I love, 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 love hearing these stories of churches, you know, who now are big and established and leaving a mark on the community and from their church other churches have been birthed and they have a section in their church where you look at the wall and there's all these black and white pictures from you know 1970 or something and there was just a small group of people just a small group of people who believe so much in the vision who wanted to make such a lasting impact that they were willing to sacrifice everything in order to build this thing up. That's what it takes. And because they were willing to sow those seeds, now there are so many people that are reaping that harvest as a result of it. And so we're, we're here to, to leave a legacy. We want Heartway to extend far beyond our lifetime, ideally, beyond just this generation to the next generation, certainly. I love what we're doing with our kids. I mean, Melody and Jen, you guys have, like, stepped it up, man. The fact that we're teaching the kids what we're teaching them, the fact that we're meditating with children, teaching them how to become self-aware and talk about their emotions. Some of y'all will not be as crazy as you are <laughs> if when you were a child, people just taught you how to talk about your emotions. It's really that simple, but now it's too late for some of y'all. I'm just kidding. It's never too late. Just come to Heartway. We will show you the way. But we need more places like this, everybody. I don't have to sell Heartway to you, right? If you're here, if you're listening, if you're watching, you, you already know what the deal is. But I'm, I'm sharing this because we need you. We need your support. And we need participation from more people um, in order to continue to do what we're doing. It, I think some of us, we just kind of think, oh, yeah, you know, this will just always be here you know and it's not the case it's really not the case there's often times um, especially post-covid the post-covid uh, reality my struggle leading this community has been um, placing so much focus and attention on our survival that I feel like it's been hard for me to just give myself completely to to what we're doing because in the back of my mind I'm always thinking like hey can we last? You know, is this model sustainable? Right? And God has always provided. We've always had enough. Even when I've been freaking out that we don't have enough, I remind myself that. Because four years ago, I didn't think we had enough. Here we are in 2024. You know what I'm saying? So I remind myself of that all the time. I'm like, hey, I've been freaking out for a while now. <laughs> but this whole time, God's been sustaining us and God has been providing and God's been bringing the right people who, who see the value in what we're doing, who are called to do the work with us, whose hearts are in the right place, who want to leave a lasting legacy. And so um, it's not just a given, right? We all have to come together if, if we call this place home to sustain it and to keep it going. Now, to bring this all back around, okay, I want to wrap up with, by giving you two reminders. Of course, we want to be generous 
towards the church, but it's also important to be generous to yourself. Be generous to yourself, everybody. Because you can only give and give and give so much before eventually you feel like you don't have any more to give. And so you've got to take care of you before you can take care of other people. You got to make sure you're all right if you're going to be able to pour yourself out in service to others, especially if you want to do it in, for the long haul. Otherwise, you may feel taken advantage of or you may feel like, what's the purpose of all of this? So take care of yourself. Be generous towards yourself. Forgive yourself. Be gracious towards yourself. Allow yourself to make mistakes. Pick yourself back up when you're feeling down. Learn how to encourage yourself and give to yourself the same love you give to the people around you. Because at the end of the day, you're all you got. So the first reminder is be generous to yourself. And then my second reminder before we go is be generous with yourself. Be generous with yourself. Look at how this one poet puts it. You give but little when you give of your possessions. It is when you give of yourself that you truly give. When you give of yourself, what does that mean for you? To give of yourself. I'll give you just one example. There's a lot of different ways to give of yourself, to give yourself. One easy, practical way to, to, give, to be generous with yourself and to give of yourself is by listening to people. No, but I mean like actually really listening to people. Not listening, thinking about what you're going to say next. <laughs> right? But genuinely listening to people with the entirety of your being. Right? Like I'm giving you my attention. I'm giving you my time. I'm, I'm being with you especially when you're able to do this with people in their suffering, in their pain, oh, there's no greater generosity than that. There's no greater generosity than being willing to get your hands dirty with somebody else, to, to, to be willing to sit in the dirt with somebody when their life is in shambles, to show that you actually care. I have a buddy of mine who, I'm telling you, I've been listening to him Woo, long time. Tell me about all his problems and vice versa, right? But he talks a lot more than me. <laughs> and something he'll say, something he'll always say, like he'll, he'll just talk, you know, he'll just spew it out. This is what I'm going through. These are my problems. And then, he, and then he'll look at me and he'll say, man, but you don't really understand where I'm coming from, man. You don't really understand. And I don't even argue with him at this point. I'm like, I'm going to let you keep thinking that I don't understand. You know, but he always keeps coming back, sharing with me, telling me about what's going on. But he it's just like he's always, always says that phrase. He's like, man, I, you don't really understand, man. You don't really understand. And it just reminds me every time he says you don't really understand that, like, we really feel like we are not understood. That's genuine. That's actually real. That's genuine. You know, and there's only so much you can do, right? Like in that situation with my buddy, there's only so much I can do. Like, I don't know if it'll be helpful for me to tell him in that moment, I do understand. <laughs> you know, no, I'm just like, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I just don't, I, I'm, literally, I'm just like, all right, man, well. But that's called being safe space, right? I don't have to give you advice all the time. I don't have to tell you how to fix your life. I'm just there to listen. If you ask me for some advice, I'll give it to you. And he does. Sometimes it's very explicit. Hey, man, what would you do in this situation? Oh, I'm glad you asked. You know, or he's like, hey, man, am I crazy or am I seeing this the right way? You're a little crazy, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but sometimes people, they just don't feel like they're understood. They don't feel like anybody actually cares. Right. So how can we show people we actually care? I'm working on that. I feel like sometimes the people who do the most for me get the least appreciation from me. Sorry, Mama, I love you. <laughs> but it's true. You know, you just take things for granted. You just, it's hard. It's hard sometimes. It doesn't, it doesn't come natural. But I'm doing what I can to 
show the people in my life, hey, I appreciate you. Thank you. You know, and to give myself my attention and my time and my energy to them. So with all that being said, let's wrap up with these words, Jesus' words. He says, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Amen. That's what it is. It's more blessed to give than to receive. And don't fall for this trap of thinking that in order to be generous, I have to be rich. No, the opposite is true. You want to be rich? You want to be wealthy? You want true abundance? Be generous. Be grateful. And watch and see how the blessings will continue to abound. Miracle after miracle, open door after open door. Get ready because some more is coming. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the abundant life that you've promised to us. We step into it now through gratitude, through appreciation, through contentment, and through our generosity. Move our hearts, God, to be able to Give of ourselves, first and foremost, to this home, to this community that you've blessed us with. But also, God, to all the incredible people you've placed in our lives. May we continue to give them our love, our attention, our time, and the entirety of our being so that people can know they're not alone. We thank you, God, that you've blessed us in the ways that you have. And we know that sometimes we, we don't pay attention, we don't notice, we don't recognize you know, all of, all of the beautiful gifts that you've given to us. But today we ask for a shift and a change in our perspective so that as we continue to be grateful for what you've given to us, that would abound into a generosity towards others. Thank you, God, for calling us to this place, for reminding us of what really matters. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, everybody. God bless you. Thank you for being here. Love you tremendously. Catch you next week.